A warm welcome to our talk show. I'm Dushi Pereira, welcoming you once again. I hope you enjoyed the rendering of the Nightingale Serenade with the accompanying slides. So today, uh, we are going international, and I've had a lot of inquiries, two emails on telephone uh, regarding this talk. Uh, as the director of Kew Gardens, Richard Bali and Janaka are going to speak to us. But I won't speak about them now because our Vice President uh, Simon is waiting to introduce them and moderate uh, that part of the show. I will just talk about Rukraka Gano and the things we are hoping to do and what we have done very, very briefly. So Rukrax was formed in 1975. Uh, so we'll be 50 years uh, very soon. And it was formed when uh, Singaraja was be about being felled by the Canadian company. And really, uh, some personalities got together. Airangani, Sarah Singha, Lucky Sennaika, Via Dimel, Nihal Fernando, Lindy Alvis, and Mrs. Uh, Kamini Vitana were the founding members. And in fact, Irangani is still a patron, still alive and still supporting our cause. So that's how we started. We, we, we got a reputation, a good reputation for having objected to the felling of Singaraja. And now what a rich heritage we have because the felling was stopped and now it's a world heritage site. Uh, down the line, uh, we have done several things uh, uh, as Ruprakagano, the Waskamoa and uh, Waskamoa National Park was initiated by Lindy Alvis, who was then the president of uh, Ruprakagano. We have had uh, projects on conservation in Soragune. The next slide, please. Uh, Aisha, the next one. And of course, that is Lucky Sennaika who designed our logo. Uh, Udawalawe and Waskamu was established on the uh, initiation of Lindy Alves, who was then the president of Rukrakagano. We have worked with schools. We have worked with the co community on women's empowerment. We had a little bit of a uh, lull at one time, but now, ironically, we are back at Singaraja uh, doing an ecological reforestation project. Some of the slides showed you that. Going forward, uh, going forward, we are hoping to have a tree walk at the Valley Park very soon. So as soon as the pandemic clears, we'll be having a tree walk. So please join us. Uh, we are also putting forward a proposal for funding to preserve threatened tree species in Asia. It is a, a foundation, Franklin in. Uh, uh, which is offering the funding, we are hoping to make a proposal for that. In fact, the forest department was talking about the Pini Beralia, Duna Overly Folia, which is uh, threatened, which, which this foundation will give us funds to preserve threatened tree species. So those, those two are on the card, plus of course, our bi-monthly free talks what we are going to have like today. So that's a little bit about the uh, roof crack again, no? And as our agenda says, the next item is uh, our guest speakers. And without much ado, I will now invite Simon Lazenbert, who is our vice president, to introduce the guest speakers and moderate their talk. Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Dushi. <clears throat> Hardly a day goes by and where we don't see information about the terrible effects on the planet, um, climate change and pollution, et cetera, and the effect on biodiversity. And this, so this couldn't be at a, a, a more apposite time. Only, I think, in the last couple of days, the Natural History Society uh, issued a report in the UK that uh, the biodiversity of the UK is now only something like uh, 53 percent of what it was um, compared to 75 percent is the average around the world which is not not enviable around the world but it seems the UK is even worse 
But if we set against that what um, has been achieved um, at the um, Kew Gardens, as it's called, the Royal Botanic Gardens in Kew, um, and looking into this in preparation, um, I thought I knew something about it, but I was astonished at the wealth of information and the wealth of learning and research that has been going on at Kew, it seems to me that it will be forming uh, a very important part of our battle over the forthcoming years to try and protect this planet. So we are very privileged, very, very happy indeed that uh, we have two people from Kew Gardens today who have given their time um, to, to, to uh, aid us in this. And not only is it a question of biodiversity, I real, just realized in the preliminary while we're waiting for everyone to log on, that uh, our two speakers also represent diversity as well uh, in, at Kew Gardens. We're very, very fortunate to have Richard Barley, who is the Director of Horticulture and Learning uh, with us today. And just briefly, I'll tell you that uh, in the past, uh, Richard is an Australian and before this he has uh, worked in Melbourne. He was formerly the uh, CEO of the Open Gardens Australia and he was Director of the Royal Botanic Gardens Melbourne for many, many years. But for the last eight years, he's been working in the UK at Kew. We also have, uh, who will speak after Richard, uh, Janika Balasuria, who the more astute of you in the audience will have worked out is actually Sri Lankan. Janika grew up in Sri Lanka in a family that was um, uh, very interested in the natural world. And that's where he he, he developed his interest. His family, in fact, shaped his, his love of nature and he uh, got into, to use the phrase, trees and has now been working in the UK at Kew for, again, for about eight years or so. And he's now a horticulturalist in the tropical nursery. So Richard will first of all tell us something about Kew Gardens, its history, background. I mean, we would need a huge amount of time to do justice to this subject, but I think he's put together something which will be interesting about the policies, operations, future direction, the major projects that, that are going on at Kew. And Janik will then tell us something about the practical side of the work which he does and some of the challenges, some of the successes in the conservation field. I'm really looking forward to this. And I also want to mention that after the talk, we will be joined uh, by, by Professor Cyril Vijasundra, who uh, was until a few years ago, uh, the Director General at Peridinia Botanical Gardens. So he will join as a panelist. So please have your questions ready because each of these questions may be directed to any one of the panel or maybe each if they if they have a view each of them in turn will will, will uh, uh, give their opinion so we'll have a little discussion afterwards so please in the usual way make your questions known and they'll be collected and read at the end of the presentations so please if i may it gives me great pleasure to ask richard barley to to start off the presentation Great. Many thanks, Simon. Um, just trying to share the screen. Can someone please nod or wave if yes. you can see that? All good? Fabulous. All good. So thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you, President Dushi. Also, uh, welcome. Hello to all everyone in Sri Lanka and in other parts around the world. Good, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. Um, as Simon said, I'm just going to give a bit of an overview of, of the history of Q, just to set the scene, uh, a bit of what we've been up to over the last few years and, and importantly, what we hope to achieve over the next few years. So bear with me for a, a quick flight through history. And I'm going back to the mid 1700s here. The date that we take as, as the founding date of Q is 1759. It was at that point that Princess Augusta who was the widow of Frederick, Prince of Wales and mother of King George III, decided that she would have a collection of, of the world's plants here at the site at Kew. Um, George III, her son, shared her passion for plants, for agriculture, for science. And of course, he worked very collaboratively with Sir Joseph Banks, who was the sort of unofficial director of Kew, if you will, at the time. And he, having some 
a reasonable amount of private wealth was able to commission plant collectors to, to go out across the world, collect plants and, and bring them back to Kew, hopefully to grow them here, hopefully then to share them with, with other gardens, with other growers uh, around the country and then around the world. So the 1700s was, was the start of Kew's activity in terms of, of plant collecting. And I'm just... Oh, that one there. Okay. Uh, there we are. Moving along. Thank you, Jenica, for that technical advice. Um, so we have several, um, uh, well, one, one royal palace still on site, and that's the upper right-hand side there, Kew Palace. Um, a fairly modest palace, it has to be said, but that is where George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte, and their 12 children um, came to live from time to time during the term of his reign. And you see in the bottom right picture, Kew Palace is, is the red brick building at the sort of upper right. The big white building was demolished in the early 1800s, but that was known as the White Palace. Um, so that's no longer there, but that was where George III was at various times also incarcerated during his periods of, of mental unwellness. So Kew was two estates um, in the in the blue boundary on the map there, you see um, Princess Augusta's uh, botanic collection garden. And then in the red boundary, it was more of a, a pleasure garden estate it joined onto the deer park to the south. So two separate gardens, two separate estates, and actually with a public road separating them up until the late 1700s. And then in, in just after, you know, around 1802, George III had in, inherited both estates and they were amalgamated at that time to become uh, the, the one site they are now. And of course, there were various architectural features had sprung up in the late 1700s, pr primarily with the architect William Chambers. He designed the orangery you see here, the Chinese pagoda also. The Nash Conservatory came in in 1820, originally to grow aroids. And this was one of a matched pair. The other one still stands at Buckingham Palace. So we share a little architecture with, with our um, royal patrons. So this is our oldest conservatory that is still standing on the site. Then we, then we move into the 1800s. And this for Q was a very interesting period. The first official director was William Hooker, appointed in 1841. And in the 1840s, Kew also became a public botanic garden. So it moved from being a royal garden with occasional people allowed to come in by invitation or special arrangement to being a publicly open botanic garden. Um, at that time also, the, 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 the sort of interest in science and the role of a botanic garden for the promotion of science and understanding of plants really became very strong. Um, Joseph Hooker, William Hooker's son, also travelled the world quite a lot, uh, explored here and there, collected plants in different parts of the world, brought those back to Kew. So there was a burgeoning of the diversity and scale of the plant collections. And in order to grow those plants at the time, new structures were built. So the Palm House was, is, was the first of those major building works that was completed in 1848. And then shortly afterwards, you can see just to the right of the Palm House, <coughs> excuse me, the Water Lily House in 1852. And that was primarily to grow and flower the giant Amazonian lily, um, Victoria Amazonica. Uh, there was something of a, of a degree of competition between different um, conservatory owners to see who would be the first to get that plant into flower. It wasn't Q, it was, um, it was the Duke of Devonshire up at Chatsworth um, with Joseph Paxton taking the lead on it that achieved that first. But anyway, so we had a period where there was growth in the role of botanic gardens in the understanding of plants and particularly in the economic value of plants from around the world. Um, Q's first economic botany Museum opened in the 1840s and it was quickly added to by another major museum. You can see in the, the bottom right hand plate there in the 1850s and, and then various other bits were added around the site again to display different plants that were being used by different cultures around the world or plants that had potential for future use. So this was a, 
a particularly important role for botanic gardens, certainly here in the UK at the time. And it was also a time when Q, the organisation, supported the establishment of botanic gardens in, in many of the places around the world that the British Empire had connection with. So they're often supported with advice, sometimes with people, with planning, with, with exchange of resources and so forth. The Kew Herbarium was, was formally established in the 1870s. And you can see the upper left of this slide with the, the lovely red painted ironwork. That's known as Wing C. And that, that's actually the oldest part of the herbarium, even though it's Wing C. Uh, wings A and B came later. And, and now we have a, a herbarium where roughly every 30 years a new wing was added on. So it's wings A, B, C, D, E at the moment. And we're just running out of space again and having to think, what do we do next? Um, like most herbaria, the, the, this one houses pr preserved plant specimens, pressed specimens. And you can see in the part of the slide that shows the open cupboard, those uh, red edged specimens are type specimens. So those are the ones from which the species was described. And, and I can't remember the number, but we have a huge number of type specimens. There are over 7 million specimens in the entire herbarium. Uh, there's a large library, a large collection of artwork, something over 200,000 individual pieces of artwork in the collection. So it's quite a staggering resource. Um, and, and not only, I guess, specimens, books, artwork, fungi specimens now, DNA, uh, living plants, of course. So Q is a place of extraordinarily diverse collections of plant-related items. Moving back through the 1800s, 1863 was the opening of the first part of the Temperate House, um, known at the time as the Winter Garden. And here, while the Palm House had given the opportunity to grow plants, obviously from the tropics and other parts of the world with warm, moist climates, the Temperate House was to grow plants that were from, I guess, milder climates, but ones that didn't have the winter cold that, that London experienced at the time. So, so plants that would not survive out of doors through the winter. It was very popular. Um, it, you can see the style was far more high Victorian than, than the earlier Palm House, which is a far simpler design. And then skipping through to the 1900s, this is 1987, the Princess of Wales Conservatory. Um, at the time, a, a, an absolute cutting edge piece of glasshouse design, um, 10 different computer controlled zones, everything from, from tropical warmth to, to sort of cool, arid sections, uh, very um, efficiently, efficient in terms of light use and temperature conservation within the building. And then just to the left of this slide, we have the Davies Alpine House. And this is the, the last conservatory built on site. That was 2006 that it was completed. And the rock garden extending up behind the, um, the Alpine House. The rock garden is of course much older. And it would be remiss of me not to mention the Arboretum. Um, this is only one part of it. Um, the Q site as a whole is, is 330 acres and, and probably about two thirds of that we'd regard as arboretum of you know, tree collections. Um, diverse collections of trees from around the world. We have about 12,000 individual trees and they represent something over 4,000 different species. Um, and you can see this photo was taken in autumn Prunus sargentii just turning quite bright red in the sort of lower center of the, of the photo. And you can also see this is when the temperate house was being restored. So we have those big tent structures over the uh, end wings of the temperate house. So that tells me this was in about 2016 that this photo was taken. There have been uh, further developments on site since those, uh, or concurrent with some of those conservatory structures, the treetop walk, you can see in the upper part of the slide that was around 27 or eight and, and the, that lovely lake across, uh, lake crossing, the bridge across the lake with that beautiful sort of sign curve opened in 2007. And then coming back to the herbarium, the most recent addition was wing E and that was completed in 2010. Um, 
it is probably the only part of the herbarium that actually has conditions that are good for storing specimens in terms of temperature and humidity and um, pest control. So, so that's the challenge for us is how do we protect the rest of the herbarium material, which is irreplaceable um, in a building which is very hard to, to make, uh, to retrofit with, with the sorts of uh, conditions that we would need to create. So we're just trying to come up with solutions to that at the moment. We've been busy out around the site as well in the last few years. Uh, you'll see the Great Broadwalk borders there, reinstating that straight walk between the Orangery and the Palm House Pond as a major sort of horticultural feature, a place for just enjoying the pleasure and spectacle of plants. Um, so 2016, we completed that project. The Hive, which is this sculptural piece created by the uh, artist um, called Wolfgang Buttress, and he's actually the chap in the, on the right hand slide with the beard on the right there, with his hands in his pockets looking upwards. That's the artist who designed this piece. It was created for the Expo in Milan in 2015. And at the end of that, after some negotiation, we got agreement from the UK government to, to take it apart, bring it back to Kew and, and resurrect it here. Because the whole notion of, it, it's around the theme of the importance of bees and pollination for our world. And we felt that was a pretty good match with, with Q's um, aims and objectives. And so it now sits very proudly here on the site and is very popular with our visitors also. It's quite a sort of a sensory experience going up and inside and onto the glass platform. I mentioned the restoration of the Temperate House. This was a big project, it took five years. Um, started just after I arrived and, and we reopened it in 2018 and it is, it's the largest Victorian glass house still extant in the world. Um, it's a massive building, it's a complicated building, but it's great to see it back open and, and with the plants really thriving in it again now. The Chinese Pagoda was also restored and reopened in 2018 in partnership with historic royal palaces. And a great feature of this restoration is that it was taken back to its original Georgian um, colour scheme because it, it opened in, in 1762 and originally it had these brightly coloured dragons adorning it. They disappeared within about a decade of it, re a decade of it being opened and, and so it was a great um, feature to be able to put back on the pagoda all those dragons. There, there are 10 levels on the pagoda, eight dragons per level, so 80 dragons diminishing in size as, as they go upwards. So that's a very popular feature on the Q side. And recently we opened a, a, an evolution garden. And the, the purpose of this was to try to show in physical terms, the relationships of plants as defined by their DNA analysis. So the work that's going on in our own Jodrell laboratory here with the plant scientists and with partners around the world, which has determined which of the families are, are most closely related in in sort of evolutionary relationship terms from the most primitive to the to more highly evolved. And so what we're doing within that site is, is grouping those plants together. So people can actually see the plants um, sitting next to each other. Obviously to the right here is a group from the asterid side of the tree of life. Just by the way, I, I noticed in one of the slides in, in the introduction, there was a woman standing wearing a t-shirt and on that T-shirt was this very diagram. So we know that that's one of the Q T-shirts from the Plant and Fungi Tree of Life project. So it was nice to see that bit of advertising within the introduction. Um, we opened the Children's Garden in 2019. Um, we see it as incredibly important that young people, uh, particularly in city areas, that young people become comfortable with nature, become curious about it. Um, you know, enjoy being out in, you know, among trees, among dirt and bark and everything else and playing with water. So that's been a really popular site since it opened. And then down at our other site at Wakehurst, that's in West Sussex, here we store seeds in the Millennium Seed Bank project, which you may have heard about. It, it's a big seed bank. It's seeds are held at low temperatures, minus 20 and colder. Um, and at the moment they're storing something around 
15, 16% of the world's most threatened flora. Um, and they're looking to build that percentage up as they go forward. But it is a genuine partnership project. All of these seeds are collected in partnership with um, countries around the world. There are often duplicates held within those countries as well. So it's a, an incredibly important insurance for the future to preserve and protect some of those most threatened plant species. At Wakehurst also, um, we're developing the whole site as a national centre of excellence in landscape ecology. And, and this is something of a new direction for Wakehurst. It's a, it's a site of about 550 acres. And you can see in this slide is the Elizabethan mansion. Um, but it has such potential for the study and for the science of the landscape. Um, in the foreground here is the earliest parts of the planting of the American prairie. Um, you see some the yellow flowered rud rudbeckias and coreopsis and some monadas, the, the purple things there. Um, over the next few years, this will really develop into a spectacular um, group of, of prairie plantings from a few different zones across North America. Um, and of course, one of our big next projects on the Q site is restoration of the palm house. This will be, again, a, a bit of a challenge. It's a, another grade one listed building, so we can't and we don't want to change the form or nature of it, but we do need to think very seriously about the energy side because it is a, a high energy use building to keep it heated and the way it is heated currently is, is not very sustainable at all. So that's one of our big challenges is to work out how we, how we, we keep the, the, the purpose, the function of it consistent into the future, but we do it in a way that is easier and uh, more energy efficient. And the Palm House, of course, also features in some of our big celebrations, such as the Christmas at Kew uh, light trail each year. And, and the finale of that is usually this view across the pond to the Palm House with the laser lights and music and whatnot, and Hercules slaying a, a serpent in the foreground. So, so, so that, that's a quick run through a bit of history, a bit of what we've been doing around the site. But I also wanted to mention, if I may, just take a couple of minutes to talk about our future and, and what we're focusing on now, what we see as being really important. We've been working on various strategic plans, living collections, science, and our sustainability strategy. And all of these weave together into the future under the, the umbrella of this manifesto for change. And primarily, this talks about the importance for plants, for all life on earth, and the fact that for Q, one of our most fundamental purposes is to understand and protect the plants and fungi for the well-being of people and the future of all life on Earth, not just here in the UK, but around the world. Um, our scientists know that we live in the age of extinction of possibly 40% of all the plant species we have are under threat of extinction in the next few decades. So, so this is serious stuff. David Attenborough has been very vocal um, on the topic. We have the, the sort of twin um, challenges of a changing climate and also um, rising population levels, food shortages, um, changes in land use. There's a, a whole range of things that are coming together into almost a perfect storm of, of environmental issues. So, so those are some of the things we're focusing on because there is a sense of urgency of, in terms of what we actually do. So in terms of our plan, in terms of Q's plan, we have these five key priorities, delivering science-based knowledge and solutions to protect biodiversity and use natural resources sustainably, inspiring people to protect the natural world, training the next generation of experts, extending our reach, and influencing national and international opinion and policy. And, and the sixth is that we need to be financially viable and, and have the right equipment, tools and kit and people to do all of those things. So I'm just going to give a couple of examples here. So science-based knowledge and solutions, some of the things we will aim to deliver, digitizing all the collections in full. As I mentioned, Wakehurst to become a national centre of excellence for conservation and landscape ecology. And we will also aim to rejuvenate our science facilities, including having excellent storage of the collections and, and open access to them as well. 
inspiring people to to protect the national uh, the natural world, um, developing an engagement centre, restoring the palm house, and also creating a carbon garden, which is a specific thing. Um, but carbon is such a key factor in in the world currently, and the understanding of the role of carbon in forests, in plants, in grasslands, and um, and how plants manage and deal with carbon, we feel is really important. Again, important is training people, educating people to become the experts. We're expanding our postgraduate uh, programs and also our undergraduate programs and creating new learning centres of both Wakehurst and Kew. And I should say too, for people who aren't able to come to physically to the two sites, we're really ramping up the online um, interactions and, and materials and ways that people can interact with our programs. Extending our reach, and this is important to underrepresented communities. Decolonizing the, the collections is also important for us. You know, we, we don't deny our history. We know that through the 1700s, 1800s, particularly, um, it was a period of the British Empire as it expanded. We know that the relationships between um, Britain then and Britain now with those partner countries is quite different. And we are very aware that we need to be careful about the language we use and, and how we nurture the relationships with people in partner countries around the world. And then influencing national and international opinion and policy. And this is about using our voice, using our expertise, talking to the policy makers, talking to the presidents, talking to the Prime Minister and making sure that they don't ignore the data, the information, the evidence that, that we have at hand that we can use to solve some of these very important challenges. So I'm going to stop there and I'm going to hand over to Janneke. Um, so Janneke, I'll stop sharing this screen and then you can grab yours down here and, uh, and get it up there. So handing over to Janneke. Thanks, Richard. Okay, so, sorry, just bear with us one moment. I'll just get Janica's. Yeah. Well, while we're waiting for that, uh, Richard, that was that was an extraordinarily uh, full twenty minutes or so, um, and uh, I'm sure it will have provoked a lot of questions from the people watching this. So we're just um, we're just looking to share Janica's screen at the moment. Just bear with us one moment. Um, so we need to go back to back to Zoom, don't we? We can put notes up, please. Just the notes, yeah. yeah. And Zoom is here, and share the screen is there, and that's that one there. Okay. And if you go to full screen view there, can someone say if you can see yes. something tropical nursery? We can see the first slide, tropical okay. nursery. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. I, I hope you can all hear me. Um, I'm going to talk to you briefly about the practical side of working as a horticulturist here at Kew. Uh, my work is primarily in the tropical nursery, which is one of four nurseries that we have here in the Kew Garden site. We also have, there is also another nursery in the Wakehurst site, which um, propagates plants mainly for that site there. The tropical nursery <coughs> is 6,500 square meters in size. It contains, which, which isn't a massive size compared to a commercial nursery, but is still fairly large. Um, the size though doesn't really dictate um, in terms of biodiversity, uh, what we have, it's extremely di diverse. We have about 10,000 taxa, and each of these taxa, there could be between one to five plants backed up of each. So we have 
actually quite a few, uh, well, a very large amount of plants in, within a small space. The nursery itself is divided into 21 different rooms or zones, if you will. And these zones are uh, roughly divided into four broad units, the temperate unit, moist tropics, arid and succulents, and also the orchids. Each room has its own climatic parameters, depending on the type of plants that we are trying to grow within that zone, uh, which I'll touch upon a little bit more in a moment. Um, everything else is done manually by horticulturists who work in there. So besides the temperature, humidity, light levels, um, and shading, et cetera, everything else is done by us, including irrigation, pollination, potting up, uh, pest control. So it's a very artificial environment that we were constantly trying to control. This is an example of some of the controls that we use. It's a very, uh, I apologize for the quality, poor quality of photographs. It was a bit last minute with me. Um, so the middle photograph is an example of zone eight, which holds our aroid collections. And these are the parameters that we normally try to keep the zone to. In the summer, um, sometimes the, you know, we, the glass house is, it's not brand new. So sometimes our climates fail and then we would need to resort to manual control to adjust the parameters and get everything back into the right climate that we desire. I'm gonna run through a few notable plants that we have, some successful conservation stories. Um, this is Ramosmania rodriguesi from the island of Rodriguez, which is uh, part of the Republic of Mauritius, I believe. Uh, and the plant you're seeing was thought to be extinct in the wild until 1980 when a school teacher sent out uh, his students to uh, just bring back uh, so, uh, some plants from anything that they could find nearby to have a look at. And he was astounded when one of the students brought back this plant, which turned out to be Ramosmania Rodriguesi, and they found that there was one plant left. The image on the right, you see two different types of uh, leaf. But in fact, both those leaves and branches are connected to the same plant. So the plant is exhibiting something known in the botanical world as heterophyly. It has two different types of leaf on the same plant. The slender reddish leaf with white dots uh, appears lower down. And then as the plant gets taller, it produces more broad leaved, uh, your kind of normal green leaves, as you can see there. Uh, this is thought to be a uh, prevention against herbivory, and there were thought to be giant tortoises on these islands uh, who would find it harder to see the slender leaves that you see lower down. Um, the story behind this plant is quite interesting. We managed to, Q managed to get material from that one existing plant and then propagate several plants from cuttings. But in order to get genetic variability to reintroduce the plant into the wild, um, we needed to collect seed. However, the plant is self-incompatible. So um, it was proving very difficult to get seed. And it was actually a combination of um, uh, ingenuity and also a climate control failure, which caused the temperatures in the zone to uh, fluctuate, which actually on close observation caused the flower morphology to change. Um, that helped one of our horticulturists, uh, Carlos Magdalena, to figure out uh, something a little bit more about the plant and the flowers and managed to get some seed. And now we have a few different individuals and we are in the process of, we have actually repatriated a few plants back to, uh, back to Rodriguez. Uh, the next plant is Nymphaea tamarum the world's smallest water lily. This is another successful conservation story, though on the back of um, a tragedy, one might say. There was a hot spring in Rwanda, and at the top of this hot spring uh, was the only known, in a few square meters, it's the only known population of this water lily. Generally, water lilies tend to uh, be submerged uh, from the surface of water quite deep, but this one tends to stay right on the top, kind of near the bubbling uh, spring. Uh, it needs about a temperature of 25 degrees to be stable and produce seed. And again, it took a lot of experimenting on our part here and senior horticulturists here at Kew uh, to figure out what it needed. 
Um, another major requirement that it needs is rather than um, deep, completely submerged soil, all it needs is a bit of damp mud. And all these small parameters that each plant require actually dictate whether we are able to successfully grow it, train other people in how to grow it, and then share material back to the country of origin. This is a plant that most of you will be familiar with, Amorphophallus titanum. Uh, we grow it very successfully here at Kew Gardens. We have several specimens. This is uh, the image you see on the bottom left is one of the largest corms that we have. Uh, there's a few hands in there for scale. It's an absolutely enormous corm. This one weighs, the last time we weighed it, weighed around 145 kilos. So it takes a few of us to lift it up in and out of a pot. The top left is is the, it's actually one, technically one leaf that the corn produces for about three or four years each year, it produces one leaf. The second image on the left is that leaf expanded. So that leaf then absorbs energy and puts it back into the corn. And then every three or four years, it produces a massive flower, which you see on the top right hand corner. That flower then heats itself up um, and emits a smell which smells like, um, well, it's, it's an odor that is of um, rotting flesh, essentially. And the flower itself tries to mimic rotting flesh. And this is in order to attract pollinators, uh, usually carrion beetles in the forest of Sumatra where it grows, up to half a mile away, which then pollinate it and then it's able to um, set seed along its spadix. That's quite an exciting one. Catharanthus roseus, I thought I'd include this here because growing up in Sri Lanka, this used to grow down my road as well. And we used to use it as the crease uh, playing cricket down our road. So we're quite, we, we're quite used to seeing this and it's actually an invasive plant across the tropics that you see in disturbed soils. Um, and you might think it's, it's uh, not got very many uses besides its ornamental use. But actually, the Chinese have been using it for hundreds of years um, in their traditional medicine for diabetes. And more recently at QE, uh, at Georgia Laboratory, they discovered that it has certain alkaloid compounds that are now used to treat leukemia. So this is actually a life-changing plant uh, and one that we grow several varieties of here at Q. So if you see it again in Sri Lanka, you'd probably look at it quite differently now. It also treats... Um, Hodgkin's disease, I believe. Uh, we also grow some plants from back home. This is Muraya koenigiae, Karapincha. Uh, we have several large specimens. This is just a small one. I thought I'd um, just add that there uh, as an item of interest. We have, uh, just to say, I'm not going to be able to touch upon all the different types of collections that we do have here at Q due to the uh, time limit we have. But I'll just, a few of them which I find very interesting and which I work with, I thought I'd include. We have quite an incredible Nepenthes collection. Um, and these are a few, these are three species here which are very interesting. Um, I'll start with the one on the left, Nepenthes ampullaria. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the concept of a pitcher plant and um, how they trap insects to gain their nutrients. The one on the left, however, is interesting in that it's moved towards away from carnivory and moved towards being a detri detritivore. So it actually digests leaf litter. Most Nepenthes have this lid on the top, but this one has a reflex lid. And if research has, has shed some light on that, basically it it's produces its pictures mainly close to the ground with the reflex lid so that it can catch more leaf litter. It has no nectar glands or anything like that, which generally attract insects. So that's quite interesting. The second picture is Nepenthes epiphyata, um, which they think like a very similar looking picture uh, species, Nepenthes loei, is actually associated with a tree shoe. And this tree shoe uses this as its toilet. And the tiny kind of um, nodules that you see on the top of the picture there, those are nectar glands, which again attract the shrew. And then the shrew um, defecates in the pitcher, and that's how the plant gets its nutrients. 
Uh, third and fourth images are Nepenthes hemsleana. Um, and this plant has a symbiotic relationship with a particular species of bat. And this bat comes to roost in the pitcher. Um, and it particularly likes this pitcher over, prefers this pitcher over other pitchers due to its um, unique echolation. It produces, it produces basically the best sound and the best homing device for this bat. So even if you have other species of Nepenthes in a forest, it will always go for this one. Um, it's also, they also found that the bats generally tend to have less parasites on them if they roost in this compared to other Nepenthes species. And again, it defecates in the, in the pitcher and that's how it produces its, uh, receives its nutrients. Uh, just a note on growing carnivorous plants here at Q. Traditionally in the past, like many other growers, we have used peat, but now we are trying to move away from this and we are experimenting with different substrates such as uh, sphagnum moss and perlite. And we're having some successes, so hopefully you will hear about more of that uh, in the near future. Um, these are another interesting group of plants that we grow here. This is um, Myrmacodia tuberosa. Uh, it's a myrmacophyte in that it has a relationship, symbiotic relationship with ants. So if you were to take a cross section of this plant in the very woody base that you see there, you would see a, a whole myriad of small chambers. And this is where ants uh, form a colony. The interesting thing is that whether or not ants inhabit a particular plant, it will still develop these chambers. Um, but usually they do. Uh, these are arboreal ants that live up in the tree canopy. And they protect the plant, but this is not their primary aim. Their primary uh, function in the symbiosis is actually to provide nutrients to the plant. So they bring in various um, organic matter, bits of organic matter and debris to build uh, colonies and this provides nutrients for the plant, including what they, their waste products. Uh, so that's quite an interesting relationship. And obviously the plant provides uh, a home for the ants. Uh, another group that I'm particularly passionate about is Malvesi, uh, the hibiscus family, uh, which I'm sure uh, you see quite a lot in Sri Lanka, though the center of diversity is actually in South America. Uh, on the top left, you see hibiscus schizopetalis, a very uh, ornamental hibiscus. The second yellow flower is Worklea ferox. The third is a Dombea species. The fourth, hibiscus denisoniae. Uh, the fifth is a Gruia species. And the sixth, the red one at the bottom, uh, the national flower of Hawaii, hibiscus clayae. And just a note on that, in Sri Lanka, we're very used to seeing extremely large ornamental uh, cultivars of hibiscus. At Q, um, because we have, we have a mission and obviously limited space, we, we focus on generally um, cultivating species rather than cultivars, unless they are of some importance historically or ornamentally. And personally, I find uh, the straight species more subtle and beautiful. I'm sure you would agree. Uh, these are a few more interesting plants that we have in the nursery. Top left uh, is another species of Amorphophallus, like the Titanarum, that's Amorphophallus uh, bulbifer, putting on a fantastic display on Mars. Then you have the second top is Eudenia eminens, a very unusual plant from the tropics. Ophiocolia floribunda, a coliflorous plant, um, which, which some research is being done on at the moment and I believe they think they will find some medicinal properties there. Comedendum robustum from St. Helena, the top right, Asteraceae plant, uh, which is now critically endangered in the wild due to um, the introduction of goats in the past. And on a small island, goats and any introduced species can be devastating on any flora. And this is a lesson learned and um, hopefully we'll avoid making the same mistakes in the future. Bottom left, uh, sorry again for the poor photograph, is Nesicodon mauritianus. And this is quite an unusual plant in that it exhibits a con quite a sharp contrast between the nectar, which is red, and the blue lilac color of the, the flower. Colored nectar is very rare in the plant, plant world. And 
this plant only grows in a particular steep, very steep cliffside in Mauritius, besides a waterfall. It's a very inaccessible location. And uh, they found that basically it's pollinated by day geckos and who are attracted to that very sharp contrast in color. Uh, we, we are able to propagate it via cuttings, but it's, very, um, it's quite tricky and seed is also very difficult. So that's, that's something that we try to keep going every now and then and have a certain amount of plants at any given moment. The next plant is uh, Hyperacanthus and then Eupomatia um, species from Australia and then a Turea sericea. There are too many, too many beautiful things in the nursery to show you, I'm afraid. So uh, not only do we propagate by our cuttings, a lot of the stuff we do is from seeds, seeds that we uh, can request from the Millennium Seed Bank. We're very lucky. We have a, essentially this big uh, kind of supermarket and we can go shopping to some extent and ask for any seeds. You might be familiar with the seed on the top left. That's Caravilla, um, which we grow here as an ornamental plant for the water lily display every year. Um, the second photograph shows you remote germination of palms, which is quite unusual. And the third, a filing cabinet like seed pod of an Aristolochia species. And I just wanted to show you these images because looking up close at seeds is uh, a lot of what we do to try and unlock um, their secrets. Usually they have several inhibitors and we need to either scarify. So in the, in the case of the photograph on the left, we looking up close, even if we haven't grown it before, we can get an indicator of how to grow it from that it looks to be, looks to have quite a hard seed case. So we would try and nick it or scarify it and then soak it. Uh, whereas the photos on the right show you, well, the middle red one, that'll show you something that's a bit more soft and we wouldn't waste time in sowing that because we think it might be recalcitrant, uh, which a lot of the plant uh, seeds from the tropics are so that they don't store very well. So a lot of the plants that, uh, seeds that we have in the Millennium Seed Bank store reasonably well and generally come from the more temperate areas. So tropical plants are to some extent less represented in the Millennium Seed Bank, uh, which proves to be a challenge in terms of policy as well, because um, most of our diversity on the plant comes from these tropical areas, which is why it's more important to actually conserve the natural area rather than relying purely on uh, the Millennium Seed Bank. A few more technicalities of the job um, as a nurseryman is looking at plants um, more closely, coming up with different compost mix Mixes. So we, um, again, we have quite a few resources here at Q, so we can request uh, different growing media, perlite, um, ceramics, grit, etc., sand, and we experiment to see what grows best um, in which substrate. Uh, the two plants on your left are obviously very drought hardy plants, and they've got like almost a, a taproot, which is almost like a cordex, it's almost woody. So they have like a storage essentially a storage of water uh, to help aid them in, in drought times. The plants we grow are quite spoiled. We never let them um, go completely without water, but we try and grow them quite tough, which is, which is why we try and give them a lot of drainage and um, so that they don't grow too soft as it were. Um, here are a few more images of some more propagation that we do. On the left, you see an air layer this is when we find it hard to propagate usually tropical plants by cuttings. So then we make an incision into a living branch, cover it with moss, and then wrap it up. And over time, this wound calluses and produces roots. And then a few months later, we can cut the entire branch off and then pot that up and then grow that on. And this is something that we will be doing a lot of for the upcoming palm house restoration. Um, because most of the plants in there are tropical plants and some of them are very tricky to propagate. The second image is uh, Nelumbo repotting. So back in Sri Lanka, we have so many, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a commonly seen site, um, large swathes of Nelumbo. Uh, in here at Q, obviously we have to do things differently. We are growing most things in pots. 
And every year we have to unearth them, divide them, uh, see how they've done the previous season, which dictates how strong they are, and then repot them. The third image is an airport, and airports play a large part in horticulture now, especially in botanic gardens. This is a new type of pot that came on the scene between five to 10 years ago. Um, and essentially it has several holes in it, as you can see, and this aids uh, oxygenation and airing of the roots, the root ball, which produces, encourages uh, more fibrous roots. And ultimately you get, you get a very good root system, which, which generally means a better plant. And this also helps in um, when it comes to planting, you don't have to, the roots don't essentially keep going around in a circle as in a standard pot. Um, I, was, I just wanted to show you how we grow some of our cacti and succulents. Uh, here on the left, you can see some stone crops. The second image is uh, small cacti seedlings all packed together. And you might wonder why we haven't divided these. And this is because generally cacti are prone to overwatering, and they don't seem to mind being absolutely rammed with each other. And this helps us um, until they're extremely, uh, literally bursting out of the pot, we won't pop them up. And this helps us um, prevent overwatering. The third image is a sand bench and most succulents and, and to some extent cacti can be propagated in this method. And we, we just stick them in a sand bench and run running water over them every day to encourage roots and then pop them up this way. The last image is a very uh, notable plant, Welwichia marabilis, which only ever produces two leaves in its entire lifetime. It comes from the Namibian desert and um, it relies on coastal fog to gather water, which is why it has these sort of convoluted uh, leaves, which then funnel water back to its root system. Uh, what's interesting in the same ecosystem, because of this said lack of water and uh, reliance on coastal fog, is that there is a beetle species there which goes onto the top of sand dunes and raises itself up in order to catch that same fog in order to hydrate itself. But there's also a species of gecko that has now seen and that has been seen to observe the beetle and now waits for the beetle to come up to get its water and then goes and uh, preys, on, preys on the beetle. Um, some of the challenges we have at Kew uh, in the nursery in particular are pests. Um, the first two images on the left you see are mealybug being harvested by ants. Um, the third photo uh, is a hibiscus plant being attacked by aphids, but also on this on this photograph, in this photograph, you can see these sort of um, a lighter shade, this kind of a, a cast of, um, of what were aphids. And we, we use, um, we try to use integrated pest management here at Q, and that means using a variety of means to control pests, one of which is using biological control. So in this case, to, uh, to help control the aphid, we released um, a parasitic wasp known as I think the scientific name is Aphidius colmanii, and it essentially lays its egg um, in, into the aphid, uh, and then the, uh, the aphid eventually hatches out and then uh, yeah, kill, kills the aphid, which it's, it's pretty brutal, and, but obviously very effective in this case. The first two images, if I can go back to them, the mealybug. Um, the mealybug in themselves are quite controllable if they're on their own. But if you have ants, ants are the architects of doom in our nursery, essentially. The ants harvest the mealybug and feed on the, the sweet frass that they uh, excrete. And the ants actually move the eggs of mealybug around, uh, around your zones, around your plants, under the pots. Um, and then they farm, they farm the mealybug, they also farm ants, and they also farm scale. Unfortunately, we don't have a very good biological control for the ants. Um, and right now, this is our biggest problem. On the right is a temperate carnivorous plant. Uh, it's a Drosera filiformis. And this is just an unfortunate image of a ladybird being caught on, on one of the, on one of the um, fronds of, of that plant. Yeah. And like I said, ants, uh, ants are our biggest problem. Um, 
within a day, you can see hundreds of them emerge and take over an area. And you don't have too many options, really. You've got to either completely remove them um, or try and physically kill them. Uh, actually, a part of my job, once a week, I end up vacuuming a lot of ants, which is the slightly less glamorous side of the job. Here, the image you see are ants inside a propagator, and they move their eggs around. Um, and according to the temperature, if it's too hot, they'll move them. If it's too cold, they'll move them. If it's wet, they will move them. And obviously, if you disturb them as well, they'll try and move around. We have tried to get pest, pest controllers in, but even they seem to be unable to get rid of our current ant problem. So why do we do all of this? Um, as Richard touched upon, uh, our main mission is conservation. And in order to do this, what we try and do is train students, volunteers, um, also go out to local communities in other countries and set up small nurseries and train them how to grow these, their own native plants so that they can reforest on a smaller scale, which is more sustainable. We also try and maintain a living collection such as the one we have here at Q so that research can be done. Um, obviously, uh, we've had several discoveries in medicine, uh, food, and sort of economic um, departments or regions. And this is why it's useful to actually have also a living collection as, as opposed to purely just a seed bank. We also grow plants and in some cases actually return seed that they uh, that are, have low quantities within the bank. And we also verify um, plants for the seed bank. So in a lot of instances, uh, people will go out, uh, botanists will go out and collect seed. And sometimes um, it's not what they think it is. And only once we can grow a plant to a flowering maturity, uh, can we then get it verified. So that's also what, why we grow plants. Um, we grow plants for our display houses, um, which take up, I'd say, uh, maybe up to 10 to 15% of our entire space and collections are purely for the display houses, but the rest is primarily for research and conservation. Education is a large part of what we do. We have a lot of tours and courses going on here at Q, and having this living collection is invaluable in teaching people uh, more about plants and inspiring them. Currently in the world, uh, and this is more to do with policy, I guess it's um, governments are trying to, finding that the only way to push forward policy in terms of conservation is to financially value ecosystems and their components. Um, so having this living collection to show their, show their value individually is also vitally important. Uh, so yeah, for the future of our botanic gardens, what's important is more collaboration between botanic gardens, more sharing of knowledge, sharing of plants uh, and training, um, and also working with other stakeholders, um, horticulture and science, um, but also government, education, schools, etc., universities. Um, these images here are just a few, uh, just a couple of interesting photographs. Um, the, the one on the left is our is a cement mixer that we use to um, mix our different compost mixes. The image in the middle is a what used to be an engine part washer, which we now use to clean our pots. As you can see on the right, we have several hundreds of pots, and we go through several, uh, yeah, several hundreds of pots every week, potting up and they invariably get very dirty and uh, have a lot of pest on them. So it's important that we wash them. And this engine part washer heats them up uh, to about 60 degrees, I think, and gives them a good wash before we reuse them. That's part of our sustainability drive so that we don't have to keep buying new pots. And I believe that's it. I hope you've enjoyed our presentation. Thank you. I'll just try and... Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, two extraordinarily um, full and interesting presentations, uh, which I'm sure will, will have generated a lot of questions. Now, before we ask Professor Cyril Wujasundra to, 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 to participate, I'd like to just um, kick off with a question which to all, to all of you, perhaps in turn, or you may have different views about, about this yourselves. Um, 
a couple of days ago, I saw uh, an interview with one of your colleagues from, from Q. It was on the BBC. It was with uh, Richard Deverell, a director. Um, and um, he mentioned, and you may see where this is going, he mentioned that there's a permanent uh, location in Madagascar, which Q uh, maintains for, uh, because Madagascar, of course, is a, is a hotspot. Sri Lanka is also a hotspot. And I, I, I was wondering how um, and if we can ever consider um, having a closer collaboration as there was in the past with Q, because you have this tremendous knowledge base and, and, and resources. And we have many challenges in Sri Lanka, um, which has um, you know, ecosystems which are interdependent. And you've pointed out, I think, in the presentation about how, uh, how often there's an insect which is involved in pollination or uh, uh, um, bat feces, which is required in the nepenthes and this sort of thing. Um, and um, you know, with, with degradation of, of the environment here, I think there would be a great benefit to having uh, additional uh, research capabilities. And uh, well, perhaps Richard, if I could ask you would, you, would you, would you be able to tell us how we could possibly in the future, these things don't happen overnight, we could possibly develop such a relationship with Sri Lanka from Q? Yeah, um, thank you, Simon. It, it, that, that's a good question. I, I should say first, the, the Madagascar um, uh, sort of part of Q is, is a permanent field station there. Uh, it has something around 30 odd staff, uh, fluctuates a bit and, and our students, for example, the master's students here at Q, in a non-COVID time, travel to Madagascar as part of their course. They spend two weeks there um, studying in, in the field. I think the reason why Q has a field station there, and also I should say Missouri Botanic Garden has a field station also in Madagascar, is around, or well, I guess it evolved because Madagascar has an extraordinarily rich and highly endemic flora, and it is under extreme threat. So from uh, land use changes from harvesting of all, all manner of things. So, so the purpose was about trying to conserve what, what remained there um, in a very fragile and delicate, on a very fragile and delicate island where all the factors were going in the wrong direction. And I think that was what drove the, the initiative to, to intervene and, and to work with the local communities there. Um, Q has partnerships all around the world. We, we don't have permanent field stations all around the world, but we work in partnership with, with many countries, over 100 different countries. I know that, um, as I mentioned before we started in this presentation, um, I know that one or two of our scientists here are actively working with people in Sri Lanka, particularly on uh, documentation of medicinally important plants as part of a, a, a global database. Um, to, to ensure that people understand that the correct naming and correct use of those plants that are potentially um, for potential use in, in dealing with health issues. So, so that's just by way of background, but I suppose that the nub of the matter is to say that, that we continue to seek ways to collaborate with people in countries around the world. Um, obviously, a key part of that is, is how we resource it, how we fund it, and, and the sources of funds can come from different places, from governments to grant funding bodies, um, to private benefactors. Um, and, and so therefore, usually they are funded in response to a proposal that seeks to, to map out what benefits might be provided through undertaking a bit of work. So, uh, you know, we, while, while Q is a biggish organisation in terms of botanic gardens and we have over 300 scientists on staff, that spreads very thinly around the world once you look at all the areas where, where there is potentially benefit in working. So we do concentrate in a few areas, um, Madagascar, Africa, parts of South America, parts of Asia, but I'm equally aware that there are large parts of the, the map of the world where we don't um, where we're not terribly active. And I don't, I think the only reason for that is, is probably that, um, you know, the people who, who are currently working are, are fully committed in what they're doing. And so to, to establish new collaborations requires additional funding and, and projects and so forth. 
Um, but, but yes, I'm aware that it, over the past couple of hundred years, there has been a stronger level of collaboration with Sri Lanka at different times. Well, indeed, we can live in hope that, uh, yeah, <laughs> that in yeah. the future. I so I, I wouldn't rule it out. I'm just saying to, to do it, we need to get organized yeah. and, and get some resources. Yes, clearly. Well, perhaps um, Professor Cyril, you'd like to comment about collaborations generally, and maybe with Q or maybe with some other of the um, uh, academic and uh, research institutions around the world. Could I ask you to, to, to give your opinion? I know you're, you're involved in a lot of work through the Institute of Fundamental Studies, um, and uh, there is a possibility of, of, of work going on, I think, at the, the Popham Arboretum. There was a possibility of some, some assistance, but I'm sure you, you have some views on, on, on this. Thank you, Simon, and also thank you, Richard and John, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, now, I have to start with the, the collaboration, which uh, Simon spoke of. Uh, spoke of. Uh, we had uh, several very strong uh, collaborations earlier. I remember even when we were recruited, uh, there was one condition. Uh, the, the selected candidate should be prepared to go and spend one at least one year at Q. That was the condition. And there are all these uh, scholarships were funded by the Columbus plan. The sea plan, and somehow uh, those things uh, you know gradually uh, stopped. And uh, during uh, I think in the late sixties, and maybe no, not maybe uh, not late sixties, uh, uh, late nine, 1990s, uh, the British Overseas Development Agency funded the, the revision of the Sora Ceylon project, the second part. The first part was funded by the Smithsonian Institution, started in 1968, but the British ODA. Uh, funded the, the revision of the Sora Ceylon, and that was a wonderful project. And uh, uh, I think 2002, we were able to complete the entire Sora Ceylon, which was started during the time of uh, Henry Tryman. In fact, Tryman did uh, see uh, the last two volumes, which were actually written by J.D. Hooker, because we had this very strong connection with you. At the time, uh, J.D. Hooker's salary and trade salary, they to the director, they were same. Apparently. Excuse me, Professor Cyril, uh, would you be able to speak a little bit louder? We're getting some comments that you can't be heard very well. I was just telling that uh, we had very strong connections with Q in the, better. Past, in the past, and we had uh, 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 these training programs funded by the C plan, the Colombo plan. And uh, even when the curators were appointed, there was one condition. Uh, the, the selected candidate should be prepared to go and spend at least one year at Q. So even we were selected, I, I, I got appointed in 1980, and uh, that was a good. And then uh, gradually when the C plan uh, was uh, fading away, that ended. And then again, uh, in uh, I think late 90s, the British ODA funded the revision of the Flora of Ceylon project. So the Flora of Ceylon, or the the, the revised hand, uh, the the handbook to the Flora of Ceylon was started by uh, it was written by uh, Dr. Henry Tryman when he was the director in 1880, uh, and then uh, of course he didn't see the last two volumes. He died uh, halfway through, and uh, Sir J D Hooker completed the last two volumes. And at the time, J D Hooker and uh, uh, George G H K Trace, the then director, they they were drawing the same salary. Apparently, he, he was British colony and yeah, the, the, the curator uh, or the director so sort of on par. And then when the botany gardens were started here in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, at least in uh, in Peradeniya, back in 1821, by the way, we are celebrating our bicentennial next year. Uh, the, the idea was to uh, make uh, Sri Lanka, the Peradeniya, the queue of the East. So that was the premise they were working on. Uh, and then, uh, of course, uh, like Peradini, uh, uh, we, we also have a very, very, very uh, long history. Peradini um, was a royal guard back in uh, 1371, a garden of a king. And then uh, later in 1821, only uh, this was started as a botany garden. But then back in 1810, uh, Sir Joseph Banks sent his uh, one of his pupils from China, William Kerr, to establish a botany garden in Colombo. And then Later in uh, 1821, only it came to Peradini. But uh, all these things aside, I think we could see. You know, I my last visit to Kivos in 1993, and then I could see such a lot of development taken place and uh, the, the advances and uh, all these. 
uh, new activities and uh, uh, commercial ventures and so forth uh, coming up and then um, the, the the interaction or the the intervention uh, to the the policies and various things uh, globally and also to the botanical community and one other thing i want to ask you in fact this is a question uh, from uh, uh, richard or even maybe even janaka can answer uh, during my time i haven't seen a fungarium at kew and i could see that uh, you have mentioned that uh, conservation of plants and fungi that's one of the main uh, goals or functions of kew or uh, mandate and i would like to know how the fungarium is maintained whether it's a culture collection or uh, what sort of um, techniques are you, uh, you know, using uh, to maintain or have the fungarium sure um thank you um can i just maybe respond on the fungarium aspect of the question and say that we we do have a large uh, collection of fungi at kew and and obviously that fungi is slightly more difficult to preserve in some ways than than higher plants um and therefore there's there, there are some very specific conditions that are required to keep some of them some of them are of course quite um uh, potentially damaging a, as a pathogen if they escape so so there's some quite secure um containment required for some um the in, it's estimated that, that while we have an understanding of, of probably the majority of of um flowering plants and conifers around the world, we, we probably only have an understanding and, and are confident in somewhere maybe around 5% of the fungi flora thus far. Um, it, it's incredibly diverse, it's, it's everywhere. And we know that a lot of plants actually require a good relationship with specific fungi to grow properly and well. And so it is a huge area of continued learning for us such that um, we, we have a, a sort of a series of, of international conferences that started out as the state of the world's plants. After a couple of those, they moved to the state of the world's fungi and now it's the state of the world's plants and fungi, which our scientists are addressing um, when, they, when they put together papers uh, with others around the world for those conferences. So the fungarium currently sits just over in the basement of the Jodrell Laboratory. Um, it moved from an earlier building uh, into the Jodrell there probably about 20 or so years ago, I think. Uh, and it's a collection of around about one and a half million specimens currently, um, but, but, but growing into the future, I'm sure. And there's a lot of interesting research going on about potential benefits from fungi and also how we learn, how we grow plants better by understanding the fungi better as well. It's a living collection, right? It's a culture collection. A living culture collection. Um, some of it is, a lot of it is, is preserved. Um, and so it's a mixture. Some of it is DNA um, because that's the other part of what's going on now is, is, is sampling DNA and, and um, analyses of, of DNA, DNA um, chains of genomes. I'm, I'm conscious, gentlemen, that um, I think as well, we have a number of questions, perhaps um, from, from the other uh, people that are part of the, the, the attendees on this. Perhaps Aisha, you would be kind enough to uh, to go through some of these questions. Sure. Yes, absolutely. So we have a question from Douglas, who has asked, "How do we encourage young children to take more interest in the natural world around them?" I'm handing to Janica on this one. Sure. Uh, yeah, I would like to put it out there that I actually don't have any children, but. Um, of, of course, I think uh, Q's new uh, children's garden is very good in that even though it's um, a recreational area, it incorporates all kind of natural materials uh, and there's an emphasis on, uh, like Richard said earlier, on getting dirty and playing with water, etc. Uh, to be honest, 
in Sri Lanka, I don't see that as much of a problem, but I think uh, perhaps in the cities, in the cities um, it could be. But over here in, in big cities in Europe, it's definitely an issue. I think uh, there's, a, there's quite a big fear of um, bacteria in some senses. But I think just general media attention and uh, kind of publicizing the, the need and the importance for both physical and mental health of children um, to be out in nature and to get used to it uh, probably is the way forward. Can, can I just add into that? I think that's a, that's a very good answer. Thank you, Janica. Um, it's got to be fun as well. You know, kids need to have fun and, and having fun, they can have fun out in nature. They can, you know, they can find plants that they can use to make noises and things, whatever it might be. It's about play as much as it is about learning because they learn through play. And, and sometimes I know we as adults think that it has to be serious and, and you know, children have to learn seriously. It has to be fun, it, you know, that, that's what ch childhood should be fun. That's great. Thank you for that. Uh, Menika has asked, does Q have any kind of strategy around collaborating or working on or with indigenous knowledge relating to the plants you have at Q? Yes, absolutely. This is one of the areas where we are, um, well, we have had for a long time, but m even more so now. And so, for example, with the restoration of the Palm House and the collections within that, the interpretation of those collections will very much be a co-creation project where indigenous knowledge of the plants is brought to the fore on, on an equal level as, as any other information we're presenting. So we see that as being the model that we need to move forward with um, in terms of information about plants because it is an important. I, I guess when I talked about, you know, the age of empire and, and colonial Britain and all of that. That was the 1800s primarily. That's the big change in how we would do things now is, is we need to recognize the importance of an indigenous knowledge and use of plants and how we present that in an even handed way. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Uh, we also have a question. Uh, can you please explain the importance of genetic engineering in plant conservation life? Okay, I might take that one, Janica, if that's all right with you. And, and say that we don't, it, the whole the whole topic of genetic engineering, gen genetic modification, is, is a bit complex in that there's a very uh, there's a strong level of public emotion and opinion that isn't necessarily based on the facts. It's more it's often based on emotional responses. So I'm going to separate out of genetic engineering uh, gene editing as compared to genetic modification. The difference being. Gene editing in effect mimics what we do when we breed plants normally and we select for different traits. So it allows scientists to, to in effect turn on or turn up particular traits within what already exists in a plant's DNA. Just gene editing. Our scientists are currently looking at areas of policy around that and how it can contribute, for example, to securing food supply into the future in a, in a more efficient way. Genetic modification where you might look more broadly at taking genes from one sort of organism and introducing them to another is slightly, a slightly more, um, th th there are stronger views about that in the community and it's something where we take a bit of care to not embark into that particular debate um, because I think you know, we, we know that, that what we're doing currently doesn't require us to work in that way. Um, so in terms of plant conservation, that's not, you wouldn't be doing that sort of genetic modification. You might be looking at the gene editing to ensure that a plant is better able to survive in a changing climate, for example. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's also a suggestion for Janika regarding the ants. Uh, somebody says, can't you, you, can't you somehow use cloves to repel the ants? Because in Sri Lanka, we use ants to repel them. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting. I had no idea and it's potentially something that uh, we, we could adopt because uh, to be honest, we, we have to sometimes use chemicals, unfortunately, and even they don't seem to really work. So I think moving forward um, in a more holistic approach, mm -hmm. I think maybe using um, techniques like that, which work on a smaller scale and are less damaging might be the way forward. Thank you. 
That's great. Giniti has <laughs> asked, uh, can you explain some of the interesting garden concepts around the world and some strategies for practicing, for maintaining the gardens and plant nurses, nurseries? Gosh, that's a massive question, Big isn't question. it? <laughs> I'm not, I'm, I think we are you're catching on. Time is catching up on us as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to answer the, uh, the question about how does a plant know how to mimic rotting, rotting flesh? flesh? Yeah. Um, so it's actually, the plant doesn't actually know uh, what, uh, how to mimic rotting flesh, but what it's done is through a, a series of uh, trial and error, it has discovered that this particular order works. So it, it's, uh, you have to look at evolution like a mesh and everything that, everything that goes through this mesh that comes to the other side, it works. So prior to smelling like rotting flesh, um, it may have had a, a whole kind of a complex, a very complex smell that might've been sweet smelling, but in that particular jungle, maybe nothing went for it. After going through that and failing, i.e. evolution, it would have realized after some time that dropping this or dropping that scent, that actually it came to rotting flesh. The plant doesn't know what rotting flesh is, but has rotting flesh as we know it works, if that makes sense, I think. The footnote being over millions of years. So, so the things that develop that particular trait survive better than the things that didn't. And you know, the whole notion of, of evolution and how these things happen is still you know, a huge mystery in some ways, but Janik is right. It, it, that's the principle. It's just how some things happen and how they others don't. I still shake my head in disbelief sometimes. <laughs> okay, so thank you so much. So I think as Dushi mentioned, we're coming up on our time. So I'll hand over uh, back to Dushi right now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. My pleasant duty to propose the vote of thanks. But before that, one light and a historical question to Professor Cyril for the benefit of the listener. In the heart of Colombo, we have Q Road and Q Point Road. And story says that this, these two roads were named because we had a botanic garden in the heart of Colombo. Is that correct, Professor Cyril? I mean, you are right, uh, Dushi. Actually, what happened was uh, uh, there was one uh, chief justice by the name of uh, Alexander Johnston, who was also a member of the Royal Society. So he met uh, the president of the Royal Society, Sir Joseph Banks, once, and he suggested that we should have a botanic garden in Ceylon. So mm -hmm. Sir Joseph Banks asked uh, one of his pupils, who was in China at the time, his name was William Kerr, to come to Sri Lanka and establish a botany garden. And I think at the time the governor was um, uh, Maitland and uh, he also facilitated that. And William Kerr came to Sri Lanka, I think in 1811 and set up a very small botany garden in Slave Island. And uh, that was a very small garden and the road leading to that garden is still called Q Road. Right. And that didn't last very long. And uh, uh, because that was not enough, and the climate is also not, uh, you know, favorable for some of the plants. So then the, uh, the garden, uh, the the Q Garden at the time, the Q Garden in Kalahu, by the way, uh, was uh, shifted to Kalutera, Ugalbada, and uh, from there only it came to Peradeniya. So that original road is still there, uh, close to Oxford Street. The Q Road is still there, leading to the original Q Garden in Kalahu. Okay, right. I, I wonder whether Richard, uh, Janaka, you knew about that one. No, I had no idea. I, I can tell you that William Kerr is, is the, the plant collector for whom Keria, Keria Japonica is named. So sure. the genus is named for him. And oh. he's the, apparently he died uh, uh, prematurely because he was a drug addict. That's the habit he you know, got from, you know, from while he was in uh, China. He was an opium right. addict. Okay, so we have come one and a half hours down the road, and uh, it is my uh, pleasant duty to thank uh, everyone who was involved in this uh, tree talk. Uh, traditionally, uh, one starts with the two speakers, but in this instance, I think I should first thank Simon Lazenbat, our Vice President of Rukraka Gardner, when sometime, quite some time ago, he said, well, I can arrange for the director of Kew Gardens to be the speaker. 
Uh, we thought it was a little far-fetched, uh, but be that as it may, Simon, thank you very much for contacting uh, Richard and Janaka and make, making this possible. A big thank you, Simon. Uh, secondly, of course, Richard and Janaka for the enthralling uh, discourse of uh, plant life and conservation practices at Kew. Uh, I really couldn't listen to it, but as I was getting so many calls asking for the web link and passcode, so I, I will have to listen to it again. But from the bit I heard, certainly it was very educative. And thank you so, ever so much. Professor Cyril, thank you for your valuable contribution. Professor Cyril is a household name where botany is concerned in Sri Lanka. And he is the person in Sri Lanka who anybody will ask a question who wants anything clarified, Professor Cyril has the answer. And he's always obliging, always uh, uh, willing to accommodate anyone. In fact, he uh, he's the head of our steering committee on our ecological reforestation project in Singaraja on the buffer zone, as I said. One little uh, question to Janaka again. In our slideshow, there was a, uh, there was a uh, Nepenthes, uh, plant, if you can kindly identify that for me and send me an email later on. Okay. Then, of course, uh, I have to thank uh, Irandi Ranasinghe, one of our members who obliged us with the poster. Uh, she has been doing this for all our pre-talks. And as you see, Janaka and Richard, a beautiful po poster made by one of our members, Irandi Ranasinghe. And Aisha Ratnayaka, our coordinator and who did and the logistics for this event. Aisha, thank you very much. Last, but certainly not the least, our evergreen secretary, Professor Shirani Balasuria. Shirani, I, Shirani, I wonder whether I can request you to put your video on. Shirani is, really should have been the president and I should have been the secretary. But Shirani is always a person behind the scenes. Oh, there she is, <laughs> always behind the scenes, always working very gently and quietly, but making it happen. So a big thank you to Professor Shirani Balasuria. And finally, to all your listeners, we had a, uh, we had a total participants of 129 today, which was quite good com considering it's a Sunday evening and uh, who cares about uh, plant life in uh, economic situation we are facing now. But thank you very much for all the participants to make this happen. So uh, a, a very big thank you to everybody. I will ask us to put our slideshow on, listen to the Nightingale Serenade, and a good night from me and Rukh Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Tushi. Thank you. Thank you, Dushi.